happened other than it just was not working. And <clears throat> But here we are, and we are so thrilled that you guys are all coming in. Um, okay. Okay, Mark, thank you for sharing the link. Yeah. So people are rolling in, and I'll just <laughs> re... I'll restart what I was talking about before that you might have seen on the replay on the last one, but we will just <laughs> start it over because this one will be actually recorded and uploaded to YouTube um, for, for future watches. But thank you for joining tonight in our... It's my first of my newest endeavor called Fertility Sessions where I am bringing to you free advice from women's health experts. So, expert advice from women's health experts on pertinent health. Tonight, we discussing miscarriage, how to avoid it and have a healthy pregnancy and baby. And my co-host this evening is my dear friend and colleague, Mark Sklar. Hi, hey, everybody. Mark. I know everyone's late joining. Say hi. Oh, put on your lower third again, sweetie. Oh, uh, yeah, I will. Um, just so we can know who Mark is at all times. Um, <laughs> so Mark and I went to graduate school together uh, 15 years ago, and we have been in the thick of it since then, and we have always have conversations discussing fertility, business, life, babies that are crying in the background, if you can hear mine right now. He is crying. And, and anyway, we... We love to share and empower women with as much information as we possibly can so that they can improve their fertility and can get pregnant faster. It's really just um, so important to both of us. And so we're so glad that you have taken the time to join us and that you took the time to send me all these emails with all of your wonderful questions. It gives us so much to talk about in you know the hour and a half or so that we have with you guys. And um, so on that note, I do feel like we should get right to it. Can I ask you, Mark, though, on your computer, do you see viewers coming to this page? Is it live and there's viewers? We've got, we've got two joining us on this group. I and yeah. um, and I think everyone's still watching. I just think some people are watching the replay on the other. At some point, as they get into, like, the five-minute mark, I think they'll realize <laughs> that we were having technical issues. And I keep posting the new link. Okay. So I think we'll get we'll get new uh, new viewership in just a little bit. But we should go ahead. At least we've got two joining us and um, yeah. we can go from there. there. Yeah, there's twenty six on the other page of the right. So we will we will get there. Um, yeah. because I I see you. I think you guys have seen our old messages on here. Okay. So as long as right, this will be recorded and it We'll live on YouTube, and we have plenty of questions to answer and go through. So uh, <clears throat> with that being said, yeah, let's just get to it. So yep. miscarriage, unfortunately, is, is more common than people realize until they have one and they talk to other people about it. And so often in the clinic... They happen and women are A, surprised, and, and B, obviously very disappointed, and, and C, they feel alone. So I thought this was a very important topic to talk about right away because I don't want you to feel isolated. It's somewhere between 10 and 20% of pregnancies and in miscarriage. The rate of miscarriage does not go up that significantly with age, as, as some of you might have been told. I think hmm. it's somewhere around like 10 to 12% when women under 35 and it's about 15 to 18 percent in women over 35 so it's not that significant of a difference and I don't know if that makes you feel better or not but to know that age doesn't really play such a major role just as age doesn't really play a role um, in fertility as much as we are, are led to believe by the Western medical community so we thought tonight would be great to just dispel some myths about miscarriage, to bring it out onto the table and talk about how common it is and when to really look um, further and, you know, as I say, under every rock to figure out what exactly is going on. Because one miscarriage 
can be common, but more than one consecutive miscarriage, to me in my clinic, raises a big red flag. And that's when I want to send women out to get further testing, um, in particular some autoimmune testing. I know you're busy on the IT side, Mark, but do you want to chime in there on that? <laughs> yeah, I keep posting the link over there. Um, it it's what my, my, my wife... Uh, I am I am the IT person in my household, so any time issues come up, it's it's me. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> yeah, <I'll> fix it. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I I would agree with with the comments you just said about the um, uh, about miscarriage. I don't often get concerned with one, but I do get concerned with two, yeah. as you mentioned. And unfortunately, what I do see often is um, that most OBGYNs or even um, REIs don't really get concerned with two. They kind of just let it go, saying kind of chalk it up to, to the fact that there's always issues with it, um, and this is very common, and not to worry, and maybe just chalk it up to some sort of genetic issue, and, and the next time will be better. But unfortunately, I think when they do that, they, they're missing things, and they're downplaying the significance of, of the miscarriage. Um, I had that example exactly, you know, just recently, um, with uh, with um, with a patient this week, and you know, unfortunately, I think she had, if if my memory serves me correct, um, she had three miscarriages, and they ran no testing whatsoever, just saying because you're 42, that um, they're just chalking it up to to uh, to genetics, and this is going to happen anyway, so the next time might be better. It might not, and I think that's really unfortunate because y you're put behind the eight ball. Um, you're contradicting another, you know, medical professional, um, and and you know, unfortunately, you know, we don't agree in that situation. And I think it's really important to get to the bottom of it. I mean, the, my mantra, sort of speak, um, is always to figure out why, mm -hmm. and and um, if we're not figuring out the why behind it, then we're just spinning our wheels and we're not really getting answers. And then you can't really create the right plan for them. So. Exactly. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I, um, I just had a woman miscarry this week as well in the clinic. And um, she is, what, 39? I think she's about to be 40. And... <clears throat> I think she she got pregnant naturally, which was great. We were working together for a couple of months, and you know, made some great changes to her lifestyle. And you know, had been trying for several months before she met me, but about our third month of trying, and she got pregnant. And her her levels were pretty low. Her beta HCG was low at her gynecologist. It was it was a twenty. Um, her her first beta, which. You know, Mark and I both know, and, and unfortunately probably a handful of you guys know at this point that um, what your betas should be at that first test, and we want it above a 50. That's really what we're looking for, unless they're testing 10 days post, but typically it's 14 days post, and we want it at least a 50 or higher. And her progesterone was a 9.6, and her doctor said to her, this is totally normal for early stage pregnancy. You're Go kidding. home and I'll see you next week. And she emailed me, and I said, first, is there a mistake? Maybe she meant 200 for your beta? Because I knew exactly where she was in her cycle and where she would have conceived. And the progesterone should be at least the 15. She couldn't get in touch with a doctor. Um, she tried to get to see another doctor in the practice to get a progesterone suppository maybe prescribed. But anyway, long story short, she couldn't get anything because the doctor wouldn't let her see another doctor in the practice. It was a little hairy. I'm getting off track. But... Um, I recommended an over-the-counter progesterone cream, which could maybe help for the short term, but, you know, hopefully get her back. But anyway, she miscarried over the weekend, which I don't know if it was obviously headed towards miscarriage at that point, and, and I think it was, unfortunately, but she deserved better medical attention <clears throat> there, right? And she didn't get it, and she was yet getting it from me, um, you know, her, her acupuncturist, you know, who, who doesn't... <laughs> doesn't know that much, right, you know, and um, and it's just disappointing that the gynecologist missed this beat, and so sometimes that happens to to you guys, right, You're, you get pregnant naturally, you go in, you see your gyno, they brush it off if you miscarry, 
Maybe they'll test you for an MTHFR issue. Maybe. Maybe. Um, and if that comes up, which it often does, they'll say, okay, take extra folic acid, which I think I want to address just right now because it's on the tip of my tongue. I don't know if you saw on the alumni. Did you see on the alumni emails this week about the, uh, the phrenectomy, Mark? But anyway. No, I didn't. One of our colleagues chimed in, and I just thought it was a really interesting point that she made. And it's something I know, but it's something that we should really just talk to women about. The reason that these MTHFR deficiencies, so MTHFR basically means if you have it, it means that you can't break down folic acid and absorb it. So then you have a folic acid deficiency, and that can cause a miscarriage. That can also cause birth defects in the child if you did hold the pregnancy. But what was interesting is what the point that was brought up was that this overdosing of folic acid from doctors these days is actually leading to MTHFR de deficiencies or issues because, let me, I don't want to speak above, you know, go over anybody's head here, but so, so basically doctors prescribe folic acid yeah. and we take folic acid to avoid birth defects and, and early stage miscarriages. However, our body can only absorb folate. So our body has to take folic acid and make it into folate and then utilize it and then help prevent birth defects and early term miscarriages. But the overdosing of folic acid from the Western world, not understanding that we need folate, which folate is found in foods like spinach and kale and liver. Um, they give us so much folic acid, which is synthetically made that it actually overwhelms the system and then we have these enzymatic issues and then we can't then break down folic acid into folate and so now we're seeing this rise in these MTHFR issues so to start this well, off, and, yeah and, and to piggyback on that what they're doing is they're they're overdosing with all this uh, folic acid which can be toxic right because <clears throat> um, their body doesn't know what to do with it right um, yeah, it's a big issue. I, I, that specific thing drives me crazy when they just like bombard patients with all this folic acid. And it's interesting because a lot of the REIs do know that um, that there's a, a, a folate issue, there's the MTHFR issue, yet they're not making the connection <laughs> to put you know the two together and say, oh well, we shouldn't overdose with folic acid. We should just give you folate anyway. You know, um, uh, it, it's it's a problem, it's an issue. And I just want to acknowledge, um, I don't know your real name, so I'm just going to go by your username, Playtone22, oh. um, because that's unfortunate. And, and unfortunately, we see this all the time and hear about that all the time, that you'll have a, a miscarriage um, at whatever weeks, but in your case, it was 18 weeks. And you know the OB does nothing, because unfortunately, I, I don't think they have a lot at their disposal, and they're so busy doing other things that they just can't um, put in the time and energy for it. So Yeah. Mm -hmm. Someone, um, let's see, I'm just going to... What do you mean? You look that, that, you get on... Okay. You did it? I was going to do it. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Okay, got it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, um, so that's an issue. Um, it, it, it's a... Uh, it's a it's a problem. Uh, there you are, Christy. Uh, thanks so much. But um, yeah, it's really unfortunate that we see those sorts of of issues and and that commonality with OBGYNs doing that. So, um, you know, Amy, what 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 do you say? We talk a little bit about um, kind of some of the big causes or the things we see that lead to miscarriage more frequently. Right. Um, a very common one is is the progesterone deficiency, but that is actually, I think, a pretty easy fix, if you will, right? So we can get that tested on cycle day 20 or 21 of your of your menstrual cycle, and we can test to see what your progesterone levels are, and ideally we want them above a 15. If they're lower, um, I urge you to request a progesterone uh, suppository prescription from your doctor <coughs> yep. immediately. And um, if they don't do it, then I, I urge you to see another doctor who will give you a progesterone suppository um, prescription because it's an oversight if they, if they ignore that issue. But the, <clears throat> the bigger, more challenging issues that women face, especially when there is what they call habitual miscarriages, so several miscarriages or, 
or really for me, and I'm sure Mark, you're the same way, I start to flag it right away when there's more than one consecutive miscarriage that <clears throat> I want you to start getting basically a complete autoimmune panel. Yep. I want to see um, natural killer cells, your all your, your IgG, your IgA, which basically are immune markers. I want to see you tested for any type of autoimmune thyroid disease. I want to see clotting factors tested for. I want to see MTHFR tested for. Am I missing any, Mark? Um, yeah, you mentioned the... Sorry, I was answering a, po uh, a chat there. Um, you mentioned the clotting factors and the autoimmune factors? Yes. Yeah, and the other, other thing that I'd throw in is uh, thyroid. You know, a, a full thyroid panel. Um, oh, of course, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think, you know, you probably thought in your mind that you would include in the autoimmune panel autoimmune thyroid, um, as I'm sure, but um, I'd also say include um, um, autoimmune, uh, sorry, a full thyroid panel. Amy, are you there? Hey, I think we lost Amy. Okay, hopefully she joins us in just a little bit because we are still live. Um, all the, I, I swear retro, uh, Mercury's in retrograde because we're having all these issues. Um, while she's hopefully joining us, I've got a, um, well, I've got Amy calling me actually. Hey, we lost you. I'm still on, yeah. We'll see you when you get back on. Yeah. There you go. Okay, I will. Bye. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so I'll start with some of these questions while while she's um, while she's trying to get back on. And if you have any questions, please uh, please uh, chime in. For other users taking prenatals, I use New Chapter Perfect Prenatal. It's a whole food cultured multivitamin, folate in this vitamin versus folic acid. Yeah, that's great, um, Ariana. Um, New Chapter is actually a very popular um, multivitamin um, or prenatal, I should say, for um, for women who are trying to conceive. I do find a lot of patients use it. I use something different in the office, um, which also has uh, folate in it. One of the things that you have to try and be mindful of, it's not always just folate, because in this specific product that you mentioned, it is just folate, but... Um, yeah. Hi. <laughs> Hi. It's not just folate that you want. You actually want methylated folate. You want the form that's methylated so your body doesn't have to convert anything. It's easy to absorb. Um, so you really are looking on the label that it says methyl, tri, you know, you're going to see that. It's not just going to say folate. It's actually going to have a, a, an explanation for it, which is what the MTHFR comes from, by the, by the way. Um, so you do want to look for that, although, you know, the, the new chapter is, um, is fine. Um, and there's another question here, or another post I'll read. My two miscarriages, I had really high levels of HCG early on, and after the second miscarriage, they only tested the fetus for any cancerous cells. They told me they wouldn't run full testing for me until after my third miscarriage in a row. Needless to say, I'm not too excited about getting pregnant again. Desiree, this is very, very common. It's unfortunate, and and you know, it's terrible. Um, we're not happy about that, certainly. But that's exactly what Amy and I were talking about, that, you know, they have this definition of three miscarriages, and they just want to wait till that happens. And until that happens, they really don't do anything. So um, that's that's unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah, and I often, it, it, it stinks. I'm so sorry, Desiree. Um, you, you kind of have to, this is when you really have to advocate for yourself. And, and I know we can't look back and, and, and go back, but if you were to be in that experience, again, you you have to demand that they do uh, genetic testing, you know, or collect some 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 data from from what you've miscarried and then also really, you know. <laughs> but there, there are doctors, I mean, I see it, I'm sure you see it too, Mark, where I'll recommend patients to ask for clotting factor disorder, you know, tests, um, MTHFR, and there are even fertility doctors that think that's all um, kind of smoke smoke and mirrors, if you will, yeah. uh, that it has nothing to do with why you've miscarried. But then I'll send 
patients to, you know, these, these black sheep sort of doctors who really look under every rock and they find elevated natural killer cells, they find autoimmune markers through the roof and they put these girls on autoimmune protocols and it, it helps and they, they get pregnant and carry to term. So right. I've seen it enough and I know you've seen it enough, Mark, that there's no question in my mind that the autoimmune component plays a huge role. And in my book, Yes, You Can Get Pregnant, I, I dedicate an entire chapter to this topic because it is so prevalent. And in my opinion, all of this unexplained infertility is actually autoimmune disease. And we, we have to learn to, to quell it and to fix it. And maybe we should get into some of like the ways that we are patients um, their immune you could do naturally and I think a lot of the standard American diet is, is lending itself to autoimmune disorders which can lend themselves to recurring miscarriages so um, I know we're kind of both big on this but no gluten, no soy if you have an autoimmune disease, particularly a thyroid autoimmune disease, there's no dairy as well. You really have to go to eating real food that comes from organic sources. We want grass-fed meat. We want lots of fat. There is, um, and Mark, you know about this too, there's a protocol that they're doing with some of the the more cutting-edge fertility doctors that do see this autoimmune component, they're doing these um, phospholipid IV drips. Mm -hmm. And that's basically, the way I see it, is they're basically inundating the body with fat to quell the immune system so it doesn't overreact and attack the embryo and cause another miscarriage. Right. So I think we could go at that dietarily, too, and really increase our fat content in our diet with things like like ghee or if you can do dairy grass fed butter uh, coconut oil avocado nuts olive oil those yeah. are really good ways to really fatten up your system and quell that immune system but you also have to remove <clears throat> the immune triggers that you know whether they're in your diet they could also be in your bath and beauty products so you you really have to kind of strip down your lifestyle and, and shift a lot of things and, and I mean, I'll let you speak some on this, Mark, or, or highlight your, your video there. But yeah, you know, um, <clears throat> I, I agree. I, you know, we, we have to work um, from, the, from, the, um, from the foundation up and stop trying to look at, you know, what can I do to just get pregnant and instead look at what I need to do to figure out what's wrong correct the underlying issues and a lot of that starts with foundational things dealing with the stress in our life um, you know getting enough sleep um, eating better and these are all things like Amy talks about it in her book and 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 I go over it in my online program uh, my fertility school these are all things that we address regularly in that um, <clears throat> and it's about getting back to the basics and uh, you know Ariana it, we were talking about the uh, Folate and prenatal, and she asked the question, well, what brand of prenatal do you like? You know, I'll say the brand I tend to recommend, the one we carry in the office, is um, orthomolecular, mm -hmm. um, a really good standard uh, prenatal, methylated, folate. It also comes with a fish oil. But what I discuss in my fertility school is actually m my, my trifecta is my, my perfect prenatal is liver, vitamin D, and cod liver oil or fish oils, and that's a great prenatal, and you really don't need much else if you're doing that. Maybe if you want to add in a, a little extra uh, methylated folate, you can, but like, you know, so it all depends on how you want to go about it, um, but it's about getting back to the basics. What um, was that? Spirulina, I'll add in that. That's my yeah. my my fourth one, if you will, but, but I'm with Mark, you know, and and even as an educated fertility, you know, um, specialist, I didn't take a prenatal. Trying to get pregnant, I didn't take a prenatal through my pregnancy. All I did was was Mark's trifecta plus uh, the spirulina. So um, to, to realize that. But, yeah, I agree. I love the orthomolecular. I also love um, I love the raw prenatal or garden of life. That's a good one, too. But anything that, that has that methylated folate in there, you know it's actually a well-thought-out brand is what I would say. Yeah. Uh, but 
there are only a few a few good ones out there. So, um, okay. Sorry, I'm, I'm just reading a post here. <laughs> okay. What I want to do too is get to some of these questions that people so kind of emailed Go in. Go for it. Yeah. Um, so, from Devin, um, she wanted to know about immune-related miscarriages, specifically <laughs> if there are natural proven remedies to reduce natural killer cells. Um, she's also had interlipid previously, successful, okay. but it was ectopic. That sucks. I'm sorry. Um, we'll do IVIG for my next IVF. I wonder if there's anything else that would naturally suppress the immune response. So I think that would be diet, and I'll let you chat in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's 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 hard to get to an exact. I I think it's difficult to come up with an exact answer for this because we're all different, and I think like something that might be compromising my immune system won't be compromising yours and vice versa. So I, I think we need to, I'm going to come back to the foundational things and say we need to look at each piece of those foundational things and say where are we off, mm -hmm. right? So some of it might be mental, emotional, right? And in Chinese medicine we'll talk about the heart-uterus connection there, right? the emotional side of things. Then the other part will be um, are, are you managing your stress properly? Uh, are you eating well, as we've kind of just discussed, um, getting back to the basics of food? Are you sleeping well enough, right? Coming, figuring out what those things are, because clearly I would like to imagine if you've gotten to the point where you're, you're doing intralipids and IVIG, that you've had all those testings done, right, all that lab work done, hopefully, because I know that I know most of the clinics that are going to do IVIG and intralipid, you know, are very few and far between, like Amy's probably got one or two that she likes, and I've got one or two here that I like that I refer to, um, and so I know the type of testing that they do, so they're going to look at those things, so now we've got to look back at that from a different perspective and see what's going on, and the other thing, like Sarah, you had mentioned, <clears throat> you know, interestingly, um, that you did all your testing at beers, um, which is, you know, uh, nationally renowned for this sort of thing um, and that everything came back normal but you have to understand for Amy and I what might be normal for them might not be normal for us and so we've got different parameters and different reference ranges that we're looking at things mm -hmm. so I know I can't give you specific feedback because of what I see there but in essence, we we want to relook at that with different eyes from a different vantage point, different perspective. You know, I think most things in life are about what perspective we take on things, right? So if you're standing here and see things that way, you're going to see things differently than I am looking at it this way, right? So what side of the of the moon are you looking at and what side of this equation are you looking at that's going to give you the answers that, that we need? And sometimes it's about looking around the corner, right? <laughs> looking at it from a different perspective and seeing what that might look like. I couldn't agree more. And, and just to add in about the, the mental emotional component, I always found it fascinating in Chinese medicine we see this similarity or this, this idea that um, autoimmune issues is, is the body attacking itself and there's also this emotional component of the self attacking self. So mm -hmm. always with my autoimmune clients um, and, and particularly ones that have gone through miscarriages because it's it's almost the chicken or the egg thing, what comes first, but you start to really attack yourself when you've had so many miscarriages because you feel like your body is failing at something that it should be doing. And so you do really have to tune in to, to the emotional component here. And, you know, we see it, like Mark was saying, that heart-uterus connection. I, I talk about that so I mean, we both talk about that so much in our practice and in, in our, our tools that we, we have out there for all of you guys. But it... It, I can't stress the importance enough about it. You know, I, I'm doing fertility coaching now, and, and I actually dedicate two out of the four calls to the emotional component because I think it's that important. And what starts to happen is when the heart, when you start to suffer so many traumatic experiences, the heart really starts to become blocked, and it no longer can communicate with the uterus. And the uterus, in Chinese medicine theory, can become more inhospitable. And so... Mm -hmm. So as, as easy as that is for me to sit here and say that, you know, it's just something to be more aware of. It's not that we think stress is causing your miscarriages, but it definitely plays a role. And so if that's one rock you haven't looked under, then I can't urge you enough to start meditating, start, you know, find some kind of spiritual 
guide or guru that works for you, whatever it is to to foster a little more belief and, and shift, you know, what I always say are, are the broken belief systems in, in your life that, you know, um, we, we can undo these patterns. And, you know, so, yeah, I agree. It's like even, even the best of, of what I consider the, the, the fertility doctors that look under every rock and, and do these real progressive treatments still aren't making that connection. And that's what what we are so lucky to do for our clients, right? You know that we can we can give them this emotional space, emotional space to to open up and to heal. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I would just kind of um, add just a tad that really the ideal time, and this is often a question I get, um, the ideal time to address these sorts of things is before you get pregnant again. Okay, you there's obviously something going on, and we want to address those imbalances prior to your next conception, so that we don't are so we're not behind the eight ball and having to rush to try to scramble because it's really not an ideal situation to try to um, you know sort of address or fix this sort of thing once you are pregnant. Um, I even had a healthcare provider asked me that exact question because she said she just had a miscarriage and she wanted to kind of get ahead of it. Should she call me the next time she's pregnant? And and and, and so I chuckled um, and I said, no, we need to start. We need to start now. And I explained it. And she, I mean, she obviously got it. She understood. But um, it, sometimes it just doesn't seem as, as uh, commonplace to think of it that way. And, and another thing I'd add too is I had just had a woman, similar situation, had a miscarriage we did, you know, a consult and same thing. Should I call you next time I'm pregnant? And I said, no, you should go and get all these testing done. And then she met with a specialist who told her that running those tests would be too expensive and it's not worth it. Just get pregnant again. And so she listened to him and she had a second miscarriage. And, you know, and I'm not saying, you know, anything other than, and so now, now she's getting this testing done and taking the three months off that I had recommended in between trying to get pregnant. So she had back-to-back -back pregnancies and back-to-back -back miscarriages, which is one thing you, you need to be really conscious of. Those miscarriages really take a toll on your body. And so you, you need a break. You need time to recover. And I know a lot of women say, but time means I'm getting older and I don't have that much time. And what I always say is, but the work that we do, you know, the, the tools that Mark and I give our clients actually preserves your, your age, I think, if not actually fights the aging process. So I actually yeah. think you're improving your health and you're going to be coming at this with younger cells. So <clears throat> I know there's some questions on here, so we can hop into that on, on age and miscarriages. And I, I said that in the beginning, which maybe some of you had missed, but the rate for miscarriage um, in a woman under 35 is about 10 to 12 percent, and then over 35 is is about 15 to 18 percent. So it's not a very significant jump for age-related miscarriages. But the other thing to remember is that you're only as old as your cells are, and you can fight the aging process cellularly. So I always say there's a huge <coughs> chronological age and physiological. And so by physiological, we mean the age of your cells. And living the sort of lifestyle that we talk about, the you know, it's nutrition, it's 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 mind body, it's you know, mental emotional checking, all of that really helps fight the aging process. And there's there's tons of research. I just posted something on my Instagram and Facebook right before we did this hangout um, that it fit pregnancy, talking about epigenetics and how we can fight the aging process and improve our fertility and our chances of getting pregnant and avoiding miscarriages. So. To really take that in, and so it's it's almost one step further for you. Yes, you need to get all those tests done, but then you you know also need to nourish your body, take care of your body, honor, believe in your body, um, and take a month or two off in between if you if you've had a miscarriage for sure. Collect more data. If your doctor isn't giving you the attention you need, you find another doctor and you do it quickly. Don't feel yeah. bad. You, this is about you, this is about you and your baby, and you, you break that relationship and you, you don't look back. You know, you need support. And, um, you know, and that, I think that's what we become, too, as these patient advocates, right? You know, we learn so much, we see so much that, that we learn that um, we have to help you fight for, for finding that baby. Let me let Mark chime in there if you want. 
Um, um, I, I agree, and I'm going to piggyback on that with, with Alyssa's comment. She says, I've been told at age 41 more than once, twice, three times, that I should just get an egg donor, that my cha my chances of, of my own child are super slim. And I want to, it was as you were talking, Amy, I wanted to... 41 um, is really young, by the way. I'm 41. Yeah. I wanted to say this exact thing, and then I think, Alyssa, you were in my mind, you read my mind when, when you posted that, is that, um, yeah, I knew, I knew it said chances, Alyssa. Um, but... Um, for me, age is just a number, and I know that's cliche to say, but <clears throat> you know, I've repeatedly this week specifically on all my consultations had to bring this up because this question keeps coming up. So it was something that I think uh, you know needed to be addressed apparently. But um, I can't stress enough that age is really just a number, and that it's also not it's not something you can change. Like you can't do anything about your age and how old you are. All you can do is celebrate your age, celebrate every birthday, make the most of it, and then start to change all the other things you can change, right? Like, you can change your diet, you could take supplements, you can exercise more or less depending on your situation. You know, you, you could only do the things that you can control, and the things that you should focus on are really the things that you can control, and age is definitely not one of those things. So, you know, I, I really want us to get away from this whole age thing, and I know that everyone's going to tell you that your chances are slim and so forth. You know, a Amy has been posting that she just had her baby, um, you know, in her early 40s, and I've got a patient right now who's who's pregnant. Had, she had multiple miscarriages, was told she needed to do donor. She's 45 on the verge of 46, and she's 35 weeks pregnant, about to deliver. So, yeah. You know, like, these things happen all the time, your fertility doctors don't talk about it because this is just not the world they live in, right? right. So really, uh, you know, I, I don't want to beat the dead horse about age, but I really encourage you guys to take that age, take it out of your head, celebrate your age, celebrate your life, and focus on the things you can change. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. You know, I we will both have people in our clinics who are in their 40s, mid-40s, and get pregnant and you know, same thing after after being told to do donor or have had several miscarriages and they, they finally just find what works for them and you see their health thrive. And so same thing, you know, we both, Mark and I both have associates in our practice and one of the biggest things I always say to my girls is when they come in and they want to present a case and they say, well, her FSH is X and her AMH is Y and I say, I don't care what her numbers are. Um, I don't pay attention to it. I don't pay attention to her age anymore. I actually... Half the time, I don't even know my patient's age because I actually choose not to even pay attention to it. And that's not because I'm being ignorant. That's because I don't think it matters that much. What matters is your health. And what matters is that you have the power to change your health and improve your fertility. So, yeah, again, we could go on about this forever, and it becomes, um, you know, that's where we need to be your cheerleaders. But even myself, I mean, I think some people might be taken back by all the posts I talk I, I post about my age, but I'm I, I want you to, I want to show you like well it happened at forty and you know and and I'll, I'll probably have a second one and I'm not worried about my age you know um and and you can do it too that's how I feel you know and that's how we feel and that's how we were trained in Chinese medicine you know we see a woman's fertile window really goes up to about forty eight forty nine and and we can see that clinically too, but it's yeah. true a lot of the doctors won't talk about it. Let's, um, if you don't mind, I'm going to make us go into another question. Go. Um, go for it. So, okay. So this one was about um, five weeks, two days, and I think I've started to have a miscarriage today. I'm so sorry, Stacey. Um, oh, boy. Uh, I don't understand why. I eat right. I see a fertility nutritionist. I get acupuncture weekly. I even have applied kinesiology. How could I have prevented this? I'm turning 40 this year. I have hyperthyroidism and low AMH. Um, hyperthyroidism. Yeah, hyper. So I would first ask, have you had your thyroid antibodies checked or a complete thyroid panel? Because you read my mind. That could be autoimmune related. And I would get that checked immediately before you go and get pregnant again. I would um, immediately also adopt or discuss with a nutritionist about going gluten-free and dairy-free. Um, 
again, you know, all the lifestyle things we've talked about, meditation, sleep, I mean, and also let go of age, as Marcus said, like celebrate it and um, let, you know, it is what it is in a sense. Like it's terrible. I, I hate that you're going through it, but we have to then now look under rocks and figure out what's going on and 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 next. And and the good thing is in the world of fertility, when a woman can get pregnant, we celebrate that too. Even if it doesn't end in a baby. We just we are happy to see that everything can work and can meet. So um, you know, you know stuff you want to add in there, Mark? Can you, um, what was the last thing she said in her question? Because there was something there that I wanted to... She said, I'm turning 40 this year, hyperthyroidism and low AMH. Oh, yeah, hyperthyroidism. So I had, <clears throat> um, I think this really needs, hyperthyroidism is, is specifically tricky to uh, treat and address. And I think you need to get a lot of clarity and find someone who's really comfortable treating it because it's not the most straightforward thing. Um, I think hypo is much easier than hyper. Um, and I have a patient right now, actually, if any of you follow me on Instagram, I posted a, um, a post, I don't know, an hour before this uh, discussion because one of my hyperthyroid patients who I helped her conceive in the past and she's back and she had two miscarriages recently um, just got her ultrasound and and she's pregnant saw a heartbeat everything looks great and so um, but it we had to do some additional testing we really had to figure out where and why sh this this was happening because it can happen for several reasons and so I think it's a little bit more intricate so speaking to the hyperthyroid portion of this question I would really want to make sure that that gets addressed appropriately um, you know uh, th there was a kind of jumping on to another question here. Uh, yeah. Natalie had asked a question about vitamin D in addition to prenatals. Yeah, Amy and I did talk about it. We mentioned that vitamin D is essential. We do think it's important uh, for getting, especially for everyone who lives in the northern part of the country, it's really hard to get adequate amounts from the sun. Um, oh, I do supplement yeah. it. What do you usually recommend? How much? Do you have them test and then recommend or just general? I always have them test. I mean, if I don't know what their levels are, then I start about two or three thousand I use a day. But if if they need you know higher amounts, so like the reference range is thirty to a hundred, and I want patients somewhere between sixty and eighty is where I'm comfortable. Um, and so I might dose some depending on how low. Um, I'm very comfortable dosing five, six thousand I use a day, sometimes up to ten, depending for a short period of time, and, and, and then retesting. Um, I do prefer to also use D3 with K2 for a couple of reasons. It's more absorbable. Um, it helps with um, blood circulation and thinning the blood. So for those of you with you know potentially blood clotting issues, it is is it is beneficial. Um, so yeah, those are the things that that I recommend. And the, and the liver has the K in there too. So vitamin yeah, which K is nice. Is a great thing. <laughs> um, yeah. So I know, and I could jump in. There was a specific question about. Let me just. Well, we can address Edna here. Um, I didn't read it. Oh, you're reading it now. You want me to read it out loud? Um. Yeah, you can read it out loud. Okay. For those who can't read the post. Um, Edna says, I was pregnant with twin girls December 2014, different sacs, two placentas. I had partial placental abruption for both. Twin B and she made it to 22 weeks. Twin A was born healthy at 34 weeks, July 2015. How soon and how can I prepare my body for another pregnancy? That's, uh, that's a more detailed answer, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I well, you know, we say right at least I think a year at least. Yeah, you know, at least a year. From that pregnancy, ideally a year and a half. Um, I understand the sense of urgency. I I just had a woman who unfortunately lost a baby after she was born uh, due to a birth defect, and um, in May, I did not know her then, and I met her recently, but. She's been working with me to try to improve her fertility, which she does not have any fertility issues. She got pregnant easily the first time, and she unfortunately, you know, had to go through what she went through. But um, we, I said at least six months before you can start even trying, because she did go through a full pregnancy and a delivery. You have to realize how yeah. incredibly traumatic that is to the body, and you really do need to heal. 
and you you want to again you know bring your best body forward to carry that next pregnancy and to have a healthy pregnancy so so in her case I understood the sense of urgency and it's probably similar in yours Edna's where um, you want to you want to heal from that loss as well right and, and recover with another child but to just understand that that your body needs time to recover so I would say at least a year and just celebrate the hell out of that little baby that you have you know and um, and get yourself healed emotionally and, and physically before you go ahead and try again yeah but you you ask how soon can I prepare my body oh. and I think you start preparing now but you can't really try for a year exactly thank yeah, you yeah, yeah. Really <clears throat> great. Um, okay and so there there was a question. I've had several early miscarriages, and let me, um, I'll just go on. Uh, this is Andrea. I've had several early miscarriages and was diagnosed with MTHFR gene and also low progesterone. I was wondering, is it safe to take a baby aspirin and fish or cod liver oil together? Would the aspirin and the oil cause too much thinning? I think that's going to be individualized. Yeah, I agree. That's you know, I would probably ask for further blood clotting, uh, a, a full blood clotting panel. So um, ask your doctors to do that in addition to the MDHFR to see if you have other clotting issues that yeah. could be potentially causing it. And if other clotting issues come up, then you could do the aspirin. I think with the cod liver oil, you'd be perfectly fine. But yeah, you know, I would discuss further with your doctor. So I know there are some books out there that, that recommend just taking the baby aspirin no matter what. I, I'm a little more cautious than that, um, especially if I'm having girls, on, I have you on liver and cod liver. Those Both those things already thin yeah. the blood. So if you don't have a need to have even further thin blood, then you want to you want to be cautious. I think it's a great question. And, you know, if you were a client of mine, I'd probably look at your period and see, see what other symptoms you might have that might signal to me what's going on with your blood. Yeah, uh, and maybe take an aspirin every other day or every third day or something like that, or just post ovulation through the first you know two weeks of the pregnancy or something like that. But um, it really requires further investigation. Yeah, so. and there's other ways to check. Uh, there's other ways to thin the blood besides you know aspirin and cod liver oil. Also, depending if it's appropriate. Um, so Amy and I would probably do it with Chinese herbs. Um, there's other supplements you can use, so it just depends, right? You know, if you're also taking some K2, then you know, then like okay. you're, you're potentially getting it. Um, speaking, uh, coming back to the MTHFR issue, I'd say you should also simultaneously, like I now routinely check homocysteine with my patients, and depending on how high that is, then that might be more significant to me and mean more with your MTHFR than not. So it really just depends on levels as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, do we have any questions on the... Yeah, there's a question about what are your thoughts on PGD testing? Um, you know, I'll also say PGS testing, yeah. right? Because there's both. Um, you know, I think it, it, de it really depends um, on the situation. I, I go... I don't like for patients to do PGS or PGD unnecessarily. So if there's really no reason to do it other than, hey, you know, it's a good add-on to an IVF cycle, then it's not typically my favorite. But if there is some sort of family history or we know genetically or maybe you have you have had three plus, two plus miscarriages and, and we just want to make sure before we transfer, then there's some uh, uh, potential value and reason for it. But I'm just not the biggest fan of you know, taking a cell out of the embryo if we don't need to. I know everybody says it's fine, but the reality is, is you know, this is all new, new work and new procedures and technology, and and we don't know what that's going to look like in 30 years from now. Like, I don't know what all the babies who had PGD testing or PGS testing are going to look like 30 years from now, right? So, I don't know. I'm a little bit more cautious about it. And, and to add, there was an interesting study that came out of Italy recently. It was very small. I think it was only 18 uh, couples, but they, they did PGD in all of them and put in the embryos even if they were genetically abnormal. And mm -hmm. women carried these children to term and the genetics had changed. 
So that tells us a lot about this epigenetics topic. And so oh, yeah. that the, the quality of that embryo is so influenced by the quality of your internal health and your internal environment when you become pregnant with it. So, Absolutely. So there's something to really think about with that. But, but I'm with Mark. I mean, you know, PGD I don't think should be, be done um, as, a, as a luxury. You know, it, it's, um, it can be a really helpful tool for sure for women, especially with, with many miscarriages and maybe some other uh, chromosomal issues. You know, I've had, I've had women where, where they have, uh, you know, uh, some significant genetic disorders in their family. So they, they have to do PGD to rule out and, and to not have a child with that genetic disorder. But, but again, to not just jump to it. And also, it, it is quite expensive. And it, again, we don't know what it's going to do long term to the quality of that child. So to just think about that. Yeah, um, I'm gonna jump into another while you're question. while you're gathering. Yeah, while yeah. you're gathering another question, I'm just gonna say. Uh, Mia asked, "How often do you recommend eating liver per week? Yeah. Um, if you're gonna eat the actual organ, it's like about two times a week in small portions. You don't need a lot. I know Amy and I also recommend for those like myself who don't like eating liver <laughs> um, to take the uh, the pills, the grass-fed liver pills, and then you're taking about you know three or so a day, uh, three or four a day, depending on your size and so forth. So. Yeah. I usually say about um, three and a half to four ounces a week is, is the... What you're looking for, yeah. The general recommended dose of liver. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I just take it in full form every day, and then if I come across a really good source of grass-fed liver pate, I am all for it. You're all for it, yeah. <laughs> um, not everybody is. So... <clears throat> Nicole, when a miscarriage happens and it's not a chromosomal issue, what could be the possible reasons and is it likely to happen again? Um, there was a lot of monitoring, very strong heartbeat, and then it just stopped. So, again, you know, we're sorry for, for that. Um, yeah, if it's not chromosomal, and so that means that they checked the tissues and ruled out a chromosomal issue, then again it, it could be for any of these other reasons that we're talking about these autoimmune issues or it could actually just be you know as, as some doctors say bad luck and and it, it might not happen again and that's what we hope for you mm -hmm. but I would at the very least you know um, get the MTHFR looked at get a complete thyroid panel you know rule out some of the more common autoimmune issues to make sure that that's not uh, what caused the miscarriage so that you don't have a second one yeah. yeah, I think it's really easy. I think it's a, um, I don't want to say a cop-up, but I think it's lazy, uh, lazy medicine to just say, well, it's a chromosomal defect because odds are that it's a chromosomal defect. Right. I mean, odds are probably that it could have been, but it doesn't mean that that's what it was, and I just think that's it's, it's a little bit lazy medicine to kind of go that route. So <clears throat> anyway. Agreed. Agreed. Um, okay, and then, then here's um, another question from Nicole. Um, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm confusing the names. This is from LJ. Um, 20, she was 28 years old, has slight PCOS, regular cycles. Is it poor egg quality that caused the miscarriage? Can CoQ10 improve the egg quality in someone under 30? Um, so again, um, poor egg quality can, can surely cause a miscarriage. You know, you would have to have had maybe the the tissues tested to see if it was a chromosomal issue. But again, I, I think you know now we're getting redundant. But I, I suppose that that's the, the point here. But that you know you sh you should ask for further testing. You you should make the lifestyle changes that, that we're discussing here tonight just to best prepare your body and your health to to get pregnant and hold the pregnancy and then have a healthy baby, you know, so you can bring that healthy baby home. Um, but whether or not it was, you know, poor egg quality, remember that can be improved, you know. So not to yeah. get, same as age, I don't want you to get hung up on egg quality issues. I don't want you to get hung up on AMH or FSH. Um, as I always say in my clinic, you know, those numbers are, a guesstimate of how many eggs are left and when we're talking about poor ovarian reserve which doctors often also 
tie into poor egg quality and they shouldn't. They're actually separate. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we're talking about these things, you still have several hundred eggs left. It's not like you only have two left to deal with, you know. And right. um, and again, even if there were only two left, I mean, I'm just talking extremely hypothetical, you could still improve the quality of those. So if, if your concern is egg quality, um, yes, to do things like, like the dietary changes we're talking about, the supplements, something like CoQ10, it is an antioxidant. It has been shown in some studies to improve embryo quality in women undergoing IVF. I tend to recommend it in uh, liver has a naturally occurring source of CoQ10. It's not extremely high. There is Life Extension makes this product. It's their um, mitochondrial optimizer with CoQ10. So mm -hmm. if I'm going to recommend a CoQ10 supplement, that's the one I go with. Mm -hmm. I think it, it seems to, there's, there's one doctor in the city who is one of those autoimmune uh, miscarriage doctors, and he puts all his clients on that. Uh, so I thought it was interesting, it's, and that's actually a really good supplement. So I've been taking it myself to see to see if I look younger. Um, <laughs> uh, Mark, do you have anything to to add to that? No, I think I think you covered it. I, I like I like that last comment. <laughs> well, I, my, my between your skincare out. line and uh, yeah. and that product, you should be set. Exactly. Um, okay. So. Um, <clears throat> Let's see. Um, yeah, and then another question about a lot of miscarriages, six mis six miscarriages, which oh, is heartbreaking. Um, it's like my heart just breaks. Someone, uh, someone um, uh, tuning in today has had five, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, and that you know this. I, I got several emails from you guys uh, yesterday and just too many miscarriages that I even want to be okay with ever. Um, and again, Julie, and she says, what am I doing wrong? You know, and um, nothing. Yeah, it's not about that. So I think before we wrap up, Amy, with yeah. I think there's a couple questions that are all similar on, on, on the chat here. Um, so I want to try to summarize it. You know, basically, several have asked um, about, you know, any other suggestions on getting into a healthy emotional state to rid my mind of those negative thoughts. That's one. And then the other is kind of the kind of reoccurring theme is um, like what can be done to prevent this pre-pregnancy or during pregnancy. You know, what else can we do with diet? Um, even though we already live like healthy lives, you know that they eat well and so forth. What else can um, what else can they do? So I kind of wanted to lump all those yeah, go, go together because I think they're all kind of similar in in posting that question out there. So uh, you want to chime in first? Do you want me to go for it? I, either way, but go for it. Um, so I think first to address the the emotional component. It's it's again hard to to give such general advice, but I, I think a big piece of it is is the letting go and accepting what happened and and getting back to that place where you trust and have faith in your body again. Processing through any any emotions that are there, like anger, or frustration, sadness, sorrow, and doing that by you know, whether it's like journaling or, or meditating, joining, you know, a session like this just to hear that, you know, we had 192 signups for this. So you are far from alone in this process, you know, and and I think understanding that makes makes you feel a little bit better, at least I hope it does, but that women go on to get through this, you know, and so to, to kind of step back a little bit more and and see the bigger picture of things and, and have more faith and hope. And and my biggest thing is I, is I don't want to see women lose faith or, or the belief that their body can do this. And so I, I always work with women to, to adopt mantras, if you will, like I have the power to change my health and improve my fertility or or my body can do this. You know, and in my coaching sessions I I have the group just sit silent for you know, about a minute or two, and I'll ask them, do you think that you will have this child? Do you think you can get pregnant, you know? Do you think you will carry it to term? And 
And I'd say, you know, 11 years doing this, that most every single woman, the answer is yes. And so if you know that in your heart and that answer is yes, then to, to get back to that place and, and trust, you know, and then also trust that you found this this webinar for a reason and you found Mark and I for a reason and, and you know, trust that you're, you're on this path and, um, and, and you can do it and to keep looking and, and asking for help and, you know, guidance and, and again, just, just having faith and trusting in your body. Um, yeah. I'm going to add into that. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I can't, uh, I can't agree more. I mean, it's just about getting back to trusting yourself and, um, and taking those negative thoughts and really pulling them out and, and throwing them away. I know it's easier to say it than it is to do it, but um, it, that's really what it's about. It's about getting back to that space where where you were before, like right before you started trying that first time, and you knew and you felt really positive. It's about getting back to that to that space. Um, one of the things that I uh, teach in in my fertility school, and I encourage patients to do, is you know, I call it my, my pregnancy avatar. So if you've been pregnant before, I think it's really easy to do. It's imagining yourself at like 38 weeks pregnant, right? And what do you feel like? And what's the pregnancy been like? And you're getting ready for for um, labor and delivery and you're just preparing, right? So it's about putting your mind back in that state versus being in the whole negative state. So if you've been pregnant and you're going through secondary infertility and dealing with miscarriages, then I think it's easier potentially to get to that point. And if you've never been there, then just what, imagine what it could be like. And, and not just think about it, but really write it down. Write down all the details as intricate as it can be. Um, and use that as a, as a therapeutic tool to get out of that negative state where you were and to push you and propel you into that positive place. So, uh, you know, those are some tools to deal with the emotional side of things for, for the for whoever asked that that specific question um, and then you know kind of going back to diet and what you can do it's I think it's important to slow down so in terms of lifestyle like we're, we're so used to going 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 yeah we eat well but you know maybe we're eating on the go all the time and everything's rushed right and we're just going from here to there and I understand we've got to work and do things I get it you know <laughs> my, my life is busy too I, I understand but I, I think it's really important to unplug to detach from technology as we're using it as a source right now, but you know all of those things to really try to take a step back, slow down. So sometimes it's not just about diet, right? You're doing all the right things in diet, but are you eating too fast? Are you taking the time to really um, be with yourself and your loved ones and enjoy life and de-stress? So it's maybe it's those other things. You know, it's it's hard to know because it is so patient specific based on what's going on with you and how we evaluate you so sometimes it's hard to give those specific um, recommendations yeah and I would just like to add in um, about that that letting go concept so I had had a conversation with with Deepak Chopra one day and he was talking about fertility and I said because he always talks about um, if you don't know who he is he's you know <laughs> <laughs> at this point published, but he's on this real anti-aging kick, and everything's about fighting the aging process. But he doesn't talk about fertility, and so I had asked him, "Why don't you discuss, you know, fertility? I think you could really help so many women if you if you brought the science there, you know." And um, and and he agreed, and you know, he's he said it's it's you know you can really fight the aging process with any age-related disease. So, but he is an endocrinologist by training, and. And he actually said to me, well, what do you think about FSHR? And I, and I laughed, <clears> and I said, I don't think they're that important. He said, they're not important at all. Um, but he had said, you know, you have to tell, tell women to learn to let go. And I said, well, you should come to my clinic and, and tell that to my patients, because you can't. When I'm sitting there telling them, I want you to change this about your diet, and then I want you to meditate, and I make sure you sleep, and, you know, I can't then say, oh, and then I want you to let go, you know, so that, that doesn't work, you know. And he said, well, I don't mean it like that. I just mean it like, like you, you've placed the request, you, you've asked for it, trust that you're being led down the path that's going to bring you to your, your desire. You know? so, so trust the process rather than like thinking that you're, you're going to do this one thing and it's going to change everything and you're going to be pregnant tomorrow. You know? And that, that could happen. And for some girls it does happen, which is very frustrating for other women. But... Just this idea that, you know, to go back to this, this trusting process to slow down, 
to appreciate where you are in life, you know, to to try to, and I always say this, you know, to try to be happy now, not when. Mm -hmm. I know in the fertility struggle, it's just, you're going to be, no, I'm going to be happy when I get that baby, and that's it, you know, I don't want to talk about it anymore kind of thing. I, I hear that a lot, and, and I have to, you know, just, uh, so, in you know, even in my coaching sessions, and, and I'm sure you do this all the time too, Mark, is I say, okay, t tell me a time when you were really happy in your life, and what were some of the things you were doing, and I want you to go back and you know, like one of my girls started taking piano lessons again because it was something that really made her so happy and, and she'd lost touch with that because she was so consumed by this process. And, you know, another one is doing improv classes and, you know, whatever. Or maybe it's just a date night with, with your partner, you know, and, and just getting back to having sex that's not around ovulation, you know. So whatever it is, it's to just kind of step back and, and be present in the moment, be, be aware that... Um, that life is still going on and that you should be a part of it. I don't want you to put your life on hold for all of this. And I also want you to take our recommendations and, and our lifestyle recommendations as a way to improve your health and realize that your fertility is an extension of your health. You know, so when you get your health into good shape, your fertility follows. And, you know, I say it in my book um, that, you know, I call it your self-love health mission. It's because you love yourself that you're embracing all of this and you're, you're taking that in. And from there, your fertility will thrive. And again, all of this is so easier said than done. But, but just to know that you can do it. There's, there's so many women that Mark and I have worked with that have done it. So you can do it. We know you can do it, you know. And, and again, I, I truly believe that you're always where you're supposed to be. And so you found us in this webinar for a reason. And and you know, I hope I hope we're helping. That's all. Yeah, you know, and I'll I'll piggyback on that. And while I'm doing that, Amy, someone asked, um, Ariana asked if you can maybe type in the uh, the name of the CoQ10 supplement for everybody up there. Um, <clears throat> but um, you know, I wanna I wanna stress and piggyback on that and say how powerful our words are, and I think we often forget it or we ignore it. So this kind of like this play on words, right, this like little detail of I want to be pregnant, yeah. right? Because then you're always wanting to be pregnant, right? And right. so yeah. you've got to be careful of the words that you're using, right? Because you were just saying that. Um, and so I, I don't want to glance over that. I think it's really important that, and I think what Deepak ch said, which was so beautiful, <laughs> you know, about... Uh, accepting the process and believing in it and then letting go with it, right? Every time I keep saying let it go, I just hear the song in my head. Um, but but I, it's, it's beautiful what he said because it's about saying that we are pregnant. We love ourselves right now. We, yeah. we, we, we believe in ourselves, and we are happy regardless of what happens, and we are happy right now. And then letting go with the process. I can't tell you how many women come in and say, you know, um, a, a good friend of ours actually as well had done this. She said, like, I had finally given up and just kind of let go and just given into the process. And then I found out I was pregnant, right? You know. I, I don't want to say it's like magic, but you know yeah. there is something to it, and I can't tell you how often I find the same thing for myself in life. Like, if I'm trying to grab onto something too hard, mm -hmm. it just doesn't happen because you're just constantly grabbing and like strangling it. You got to let go. You got to create space for things to grow and thrive in, right? And so, um, watch your words, watch how you say certain things, and what you believe, um, and really try to take a step back and and just believe in the process and let go. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. No, you know, at all. I, I, I totally second everything he just said. And, you know, we're going to start wrapping it up here because it is 9.30. Um, apologize again for the... For you. In the, the beginning of this session, I am not the technical genius that you might think I am. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm getting better, and I believe in myself. I do, you know, so... So we can take that as another life lesson, you know, it's just um, the, the good intention is there. And so we, we thank you so much for joining in and you can find out more information about me on my website, amyrop.com and my latest book, Yes, You Can Get Pregnant. Um, I'm offering online fertility coaching sessions now, which they're, they're group and they're one-on-one -on -one sessions. And 
so that's available for women anywhere in the world. Seems to be going really great, and I, and I love offering this service to to all of you. And Mark, I'll let you wrap up with with your lovely tools. Sure, sure. Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, if you want to reach me and, and see what I'm all about, um, you can reach me at marksklar.com. I'm also on Instagram and tons of videos on, on YouTube and, and Facebook and so forth. Um, I do, just like Amy, we, we both offer one-on-one -on -one and private consultations. Um, but in addition, in February, my online fertility uh, program, My Fertility School, is, is launching again. Um, it's a six-week program, and if anyone's interested, you can find out more about it. Um, on my website or maybe Amy is going to post a link or something I'm not sure um, so anyway thanks so much everyone for joining us um, outside of the technical difficulties uh, which maybe gave Amy and I a little bit of palpitations um, <laughs> <laughs> we, we really uh, I enjoyed myself it was it was a, a great night I really enjoyed the all the questions and I appreciate um, everyone joining us and, and sticking through with all the difficulties we had so thank you so much Thank you. Um, thank you, guys. And, and as Mark said, I'll follow up with an email with the link to view this live again on YouTube and with Mark and I, uh, Mark and my, all of our, our links so you can find us and get in touch with us. But thank you so much for sharing and for joining in. And we, we wish you only good, fertile things in your future. Thank yeah. You. Until next time. Until next Bye, time. everyone. Bye.